Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Pilates Hour. And uh, my heart is filled. I'm excited for what we are to learn today and listen to. I have a very special panel of friends and guests that are going to be with us today. Um, unlike most Pilates Hours, where I tend to talk a lot, I'm going to try to take a back seat. I will take a back seat and let our guests share with us and let us learn how to listen and to learn. And by the end of this, we should have some actionable items of how we can combat racism, uh, particularly in our professions, um, but more importantly, in our communities, in our homes. I was listening to a broadcast uh, the other day from uh, Emmanuel Acho, and he said, more things are caught than they are taught. And what this made me think of was just how we live our lives and the things that happen in our homes that our children catch as things that have to do with prejudice and racisms that, um, that we need to be incredibly conscious of and to listen and to be able to, um, to prevent that. So today we're going to learn a lot and I have a couple special guests I wanna introduce. Um, D'Amico Robinson is one of uh, my students at the University of St. Augustine and uh, she's just working on her doctor's in physical therapy degree. She's from Ocala, Florida. Uh, she has experience. She's served on uh, the National Council of Negro Women in her university and undergrad, and is very excited to bring awareness to education, uh, justice, equality, anti-racism. And one thing I'll tell about Demika real quick is she said something to me the other day as we were talking that really impacted me from that um, point of the privileged white man um, thinking that that I am understanding or thinking that I am um, you know not racist or thinking that I am a person of equality and she asked me a question that touched me very deeply that made me really want to make this come about because I think we all need to hear these kind of things but she had mentioned how she never was really sure if she was being graded or judged in her studies or anything for that matter in life um, based on her color or her merits. And she asked me if I had ever experienced the feeling of being judged based on the color of my skin. And it was just a, a light bulb went off for me, Demika. so I thank you for that. But it was like, no, I haven't. I don't understand that. I don't know that feeling. And I have to now try to figure out how can I make sure that I don't replicate that feeling to somebody of color? You know, how do I ensure the trust or build that trust over time? So it's great to have you with us, Demika. Thank you. Uh, Kenneth Montes de Oca is one of our Polestar graduates. Uh, he was in the University of, of Rutgers and in the dance program. Uh, he's a professional dancer. He has his own dance company. He does great work in developing and creating work that tells the story, black stories, promoting narratives of African uh, diaspora. And um, he also is a Pilates teacher. He was trained by one of our dear educators, Kim Jibalisco at Rutgers University. And it's really good to have you with us, Kenneth. Um, one of the things Kenneth had immediately had sent a whole bunch of items that we're gonna share with you on this webinar that I think are really important. So Kenneth has a lot of great ideas of how we can improve our community and our profession. So we're excited for that. Um, my dear friend, Peter Callen from Miami. Uh, Peter and I share three languages in common, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And we go back uh, almost 20 years as dear friends and our daughters introduced us when they were best friends in high school. And, and uh, so it's been great. Peter and I also serve on a board in Miami. Uh, Peter has a law degree. He's worked in many aspects of business and law, and he went back uh, to study international human rights and human dignity. And he is, in the last you know couple decades, has really been focusing on spirituality and well-being through yoga, meditation, and Pilates. Also, had gone through some training with Polestar, and uh, has really developed a beautiful work that he does and touches a lot of people's lives in the Miami area. And then lastly, but by no means least, is my dear friend Stella. And Stella is the um, operations, chief of operations, I would say, our operations manager for Bazzi Pilates. 
And uh, Rel Sackwitz is my dear friend and Stella makes sure that Rel looks good all the time um, and that the operation runs smoothly. And she's an invaluable leader in the business. She's been in the business of fitness and education and business management. Uh, it's just a, a great leader. And um, I found out today that she also has a second degree black belt in the practice of ninjutsu, jujitsu. And I didn't know that all the times that we were dancing and thinking that you might be able to take me out, but now I know. So I've introduced my panel of great guests and I wanna thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is make this your panel. So this is your time to, to talk and um, each of you have different stories to tell, really looking for solutions, education, um, opportunities, collaboration, things that would uh, bring forward to our community the importance of black lives and the importance of breaking down some of the structures that continually perpetuate um, white privilege. And we're sensitive to that, but we want to know more and we want to know how we can better um, serve and better participate and incorporate, um, you know, getting caught up. Like there's, uh, I heard one more thing that I'll share with you and it was, Look, if, if you had a race and you held somebody back for the first 200 yards, you're never going to have equality if you don't stop the other person or bring them together again and start off from the beginning. I think this is the sense of where so much of our institution, every aspect of the institutions have really been constructed uh, from a white point of view. And even though uh, you know we're celebrating Juneteenth tomorrow, I think it's the... 200 year, is it, what is the 100 year? I forget what it is, but it's the, the I think it's, um, help me out here, guys. What's, what's the, I just realized that I put my foot in my mouth, but Juneteenth is tomorrow. My point is, is that we're way behind. That's my point, is that, you know, this is it's time, it's time to, to make things equal. So with that, I will turn the time over to you. Um, I will have questions coming in from the from the audience, so we'll be um, sharing those with you as they come in. You have access to see them as well. So, floor is yours. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Brett, for all of this and organizing it. Um, it's going to be. I'm looking for some interesting dialogue with amongst all of us as well as the community. I, I think. Coming from a business point of view, um, I went to Hofstra University, which is a all um, white school and Jewish. So that's where I got my business um, business degree from. So when I when I entered the school, they had just started a program called NOAA, and the opportunity was the idea was this program was to help integrate the school into bringing more people of color into a private institution. And it did, it was very successful, but then what it made it happen was those of us who were not NOAA students were perceived as NOAA students. And all NOAA students were then perceived as less than the other students that were in the school because they were like, oh, you really didn't really belong here. You didn't qualify, they let you in. And I see Damika shaking her head going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, so when the other thing is when we start creating programs and opportunities for people of color, it is not because we're perceived that we're not less than. We're just looking for opportunities to have the same experiences and the same knowledge and that to that others are privileged to having. Um, when you look at the civil rights movement, when they were all, and, and when they were talking about education, separate but equal, it was always separate, but it was never equal. And it's still that way today. It's it, no matter where you go, they say it's separate and it's equal, even though they're integrated. It's so not all. If you look at the urban communities, there's their school budgets are down to zero. They're getting books that are so old the teachers as much as i love teachers they're also suffering and how can we even start breaking down an institution when you can't even get people an education 
So that's my opening statement. <laughs> The uncomfortable pause. <laughs> yeah, because I can, you know, I'll keep going. So I figured if I set a pause for a minute, someone would jump in. But I, yeah. <laughs> I think there something going on there. Two good points, though. Um, you know, with the inequality, or you know, making it to somewhere and still kind of being seen as, oh well, they let you in because of this. And a lot of what I see is, um, I actually don't experience too many like blatantly racist scenarios, but it's actually um, white people or people who are not black, who I like trust and love that sometimes have slip ups. And I don't think that they understand that, you know, you just offended me. Um, the physical therapist that I worked with and who wrote my letter of recommendation to go to PT school is a white woman, but she went to my undergraduate school for PT school. So we were really close. Um, and one day we were talking, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but she was like, yeah, maybe it was like your skin color that helped you get into PT school. And, and I was just like, no, no, don't, don't say that. I mean, you, you see how I work and, and you know me and you know my history. Am I not good enough to be accepted into a program? And even with attending at HBCU, I went to Florida A&M for my undergraduate it was an interesting experience because it's uh, um, FAMU and FSU are literally like a mile apart and they're separated by train tracks. You know, wh wherever you go, you say you go across the track. And a lot of people, you know, had negative views about FAMU. You know, they say you get in because, you know, it's easy to get into an all black school or, you know, their standards aren't high as FSU or um, even the budget that the state gives black colleges is not even a fraction not even mm -hmm. half not even a fourth of what uh pwi gets so exactly. it, it it would first start in actually putting money into these schools so that we have the same resources so that we can show you that we are doing well and we're probably actually doing well than other people because we do have a lot of lack of resources and we are still graduating still producing professionals and all of that so my dad always tells me that you know when you're black you got to work 10 times as hard <laughs> Ten times. don't ever get caught slipping because you have to do above and beyond just to get to a position you know that you want to get so i agree with stella mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah um same on that no i think it's become clear the importance of uh flexibility the fact that we don't have that um the opportunities lined up for us to go forward and keep pushing, then we're constantly trying to prove ourselves. But then I look at it this way, now that we've been given a pause, especially speaking from a personal point of view, now that I'm able to finally breathe and see what do I need, what do I think, what do I want, you're able to come up with these responses and say things like, listen, uh, I need to do this in order to get what I need to get, and I'm going to do it no matter what. Um, that comes, I think, you know, that comes with the fact that sometimes we're all just locked up in our day-to-day, -day, daily working, trying to go 10 miles per hour, just trying to go as far as and as higher and as strong as you can. You blur out all the possibilities of being a person, you know, because this is what happened. We get dehumanized as people of color every day because we're being told that we're being less than. Um, so it's, it, I think it comes down, as a celebrity, it comes down to humanity, being seen as a human person, being seen as equal without ignoring the fact that we all have different experiences. Um, but yeah, that's my point. Um, and for me, a big solution for that it is to bring more opportunities because white people have the power right now, specifically in our field as well, to pave the way for more people of color to be represented. I think in an ideal world, the dream will be to look up Pilates and click Google images and then scroll and see someone that looks like me. But it's gonna be a long road till we get there, I believe, not unless actions are being taken. I'm gonna make you in charge of the social media, Ken, for Polestar. So Watch what you say. I'm um, there. 
So one of the um, things I was thinking is that a lot of companies have been asked to pledge 15%, whether that's 15% product space, 15% of um, visual, you know, something of representation. And it's a, it's like a ground place to start. And, you know, one of the things that I would like to place on the table as an opportunity of discussion, not only with Polestar, but with other schools, is how can they change the dynamics in their school where at least 15% of their enrollment are people of color? Love it. Because I think once we start increasing the pool of people that are in the profession, we can start giving, the visualization starts changing. I think that's one of my big questions, Stella, and we've talked a little bit about this, is, you know, the last thing we want it to look like, and this was also a conversation with Danica, is looking like a handout or this or that, rather than, like, raising the awareness to know that this is a profession that should be, you know, equally represented in in all of these, with people of color, with, uh, you know, every aspect of diversity and you know how do we go there i think that's that's the question that i have how do we raise the awareness in the community of the importance of yoga physical therapy and pilates that can improve the quality of the lives of this population uh, i was uh if i could speak first of all I, I want to make a disclaimer. I'm not speaking for all black people, and I'm not speaking for all black men. So that needs to be put out there right away. Um, I am speaking from my own personal experiences, and I was immediately struck as I heard the other panelists of how even after 50 years, things sound pretty much the same. You know, you have to prove yourself and one of the things I want to point out to the audience is that all of the people you see here on the screen of color, and you too, Brent, um, but especially the people of color, have overcome the perception created by racism of their abilities, their ca capacity, their talents. And so they didn't let that define their person, didn't let them define their success. And I point that out because it's endemic in all of our institutions, this racism. And um, anybody who's out there in the community, uh, your awareness of this goes a long way. So for instance, when Stella's talking about 15%, it may seem that, well, where's the pool of people gonna come from? Well, everybody on the screen probably would be questioned at the beginning until they're given the opportunity to come in and show. You know, they're just as talented, just as skilled as other students, other teachers that you've brought in and trained. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to hopefully impart that awareness that it's institutional and the individual given a chance to not be defined by that can show a lot. Everybody on this panel shows that. Yeah. I agree with him. And, and I um, told Dr. Anderson that going to an HBCU was very eye opening because even in my mindset when I was in school, I didn't even know I used to do this, but I used to say maybe that person got 100 because, you know, they're not black or, or maybe, you know, they have a, a better understanding or more resources than I had. I went to FAMU and I remember I failed the test. I was the lowest grade and everybody else was black. I didn't have anything to hold me back or to say, you know, maybe this is what set me back. So I always say that going to FAMU was an eye opener and it, it really prepped me to just do the best. You can't really think of what, what another person is doing per se you just have to strive to be the best and that's what it taught me when everybody around you looks like you you have no nothing holding you back from doing the very best and um to 
comment on what Dr. Anderson said um, when we were speaking. He also asked me, like, what can I do? And I told him that initially, like, first, I think that it'll just be really good to get people of color to go out. I know when I go to the doctors and I see a black person as a doctor, I'm instantly like, okay, this, we're getting it done. They're not going to judge me. We are the same. You know, they look like me or, you know, I see a black physical therapist. I'm automatically excited. And it's not that, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable around other races, but it's a sense of like comfortability that this person, you know, everything they tell you is just going to be because of the situation and not because of how you look or, you know, how, how they perceive you to be. So I really think that just helping others get out there into the, into these fields where there's not a lot of people of color will initially help start that change and, and help people get more access to resources. Awesome. I was gonna, there's a comment here from Teresa. And um, before I share the comment, one of the things that uh, I think a lot of white people have confusion about is how do we refer to people of color? So one of the things I think is going to come up is here's somebody from Puerto Rico and Teresa says she's full-blooded Puerto Rican. My wife is full-blooded Puerto Rican. She says who doesn't look like a Puerto Rican. You? And so, you know, she doesn't walk in the same shoes. I know Kenneth is from DR, um, you know, uh, D'Amica from uh, the, also from the Caribbean and her, and her parents and those kind of things. So, there's, there's a quite a big diversity. And one of the things that I'd heard is to say that, you know, black is the right reference because we're referencing skin color rather than, you know, if somebody identifies with being African-American or identifies with being Caribbean. Any thoughts in, from you that you could help us understand that as well? Just, you know, I think Teresa's question is valid. Dealing with diversity from, you know, people of color come, you know, it's like, whether they're from Middle East or from India or, you know, Hispanic, Cuban. I... <laughs> always, I feel like that's always the elephant question in a room. What is the PC word to I... call you? <laughs> I guess we should just ask, we should just ask, right? How would you prefer, you know, because I've also heard, like, I, I personally feel like the last thing we want to do is to get rid of diversity, right? The last thing we want to do is to sterilize everything. Like, I love the culture so much that I live for the culture. I often joke that I'm much more Hispanic than my wife is, and I don't have a drop of Hispanic blood. I love the culture. So I don't, I don't want people to be colorblind. I want them to be, you know, anti-racist and accepting inequality. And, I, and that's just me. But how do you... You know, how would you prefer, like, what, how would you want somebody to address the situation just to be able to talk openly about it? I mean, I think this is where we, we have to go to be able to put the cards on the table and ask these questions and not be embarrassed to ask the questions and get frank answers. Any thoughts? <laughs> I'm looking at Peter going, I'm gonna, you, you go first. <laughs> yeah, can, can you see me thinking? You, you yeah, can probably that's hear what me I, thinking. I, I see all kinds of things. That, 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 question, <laughs> that question needs so much context, Brent. Mm -hmm. It's very layered. No right, a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it, it is very layered. <laughs> Come on, it's a whole webinar. <laughs> because pick one layer, pick one layer and... and... Well, let's, let's look at the... Um, the broad layering of black when there are so many different black experiences just within the African-American community, much less Afro-Caribbean, Afro-South mm -hmm. uh, uh, American. Um, and you could refer to all of them as black and they probably would um, fit the description. They may not all react the same way, uh, right. especially if they come from a Latin country um, mm -hmm. because, because of the the trauma of having been conditioned to think that black wasn't worthy, mm -hmm. that that was left, sir. And so mm -hmm. that still is kind of one of those pervasive, a lot of the work that I've done with yoga and, 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 um, and what is in essence a, a tradition, a science that studied the, the mental 
health of human beings thousands of years ago, it, it taught me about the effects of trauma. And trauma doesn't only happen to the individuals, it happens to families, communities, institutions. Generations. So flag, again, it could bring up some trauma in people who have suffered really adverse consequences of racism. And in others, it may just be a way of giving them affiliation, you know, to a group. Um, and again, there's, from my perspective, there's good and bad and indifferent to that. I, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> it's, it's tough. I, I'll speak from my own personal experience as an immigrant. I come here. Um, well, I, I know I'm black. There, there's no hiding it. I know where I come from. But like you mentioned, Peter, there is the sense of, oh, no, you are from here. Oh, no, you're Latin American. Oh, no, you're Dominican. And it wasn't until I come here and I find nurture within Black African-American women, I find myself being um, mentored by African people that look like me, where I find that comfort. And I'm like, oh, listen, we're all from the same tree. Um, so that's why there's so many layers, because within the, our community, there's things that we need to, um, there's, um, there's a lot of understanding to do in the fact that we're all in this together and we're all fighting for the same rights at the end of the day. Um, but then on another perspective, um, seeing it from the opposite eye, from the eye of the oppressor, it is um, I, crucial and ideal that you do understand that there's more than just color to a person's personality. You need to understand that people come from different places, which is what we've been trying to say for a while, that we all have and undergo different experiences. Um, but yeah, we're in it to win it, especially now. We're all in this fight together. Right. Most of us. There's still Most denial us. from some people. <laughs> so I would like to reverse the question to Brent, because when we look at um, Caucasian people, many identify as, oh, I'm Irish, I'm Italian, I'm this, I'm that. And you all are able to embrace your heritage, so to speak. Many of us, our heritage was ripped from us. We don't know. We only have, you know, those of us who are directly from Dominican Republic, from the Caribbean, from Cuba, you know, we, those, we, you know, those of us who have that connection, we can say, I'm Afro-Cuban, I'm Afro this, but the rest of us who don't have that direct connection because we were robbed of it, we can only identify really basically Afro-American because we were born in America and we just happen to be African-Americans or black. But if we were looking at you, would we, you know, would we just say you're Irish, you're Irish-American, you're Italian-American, you're Spanish-American? So the question goes both ways, but for us, it is very deep. It is, it is a very traumatizing question because it brings up the fact that we don't have really a heritage to point to as a people. We're, we're connecting to it, we're trying to bring it up, we're teaching it, we're creating our own um, culture, so to speak, but we don't have, we don't have our names. You know, you can go back and say, my grandfather was called this, my blah, 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 blah. I can't go beyond two generations in my family and say their African name was. Yeah. So yeah. When you ask if you want, what is our name or what do we prefer to be called? It is a very deep, long conversation that would not <laughs> be here, but also one that, you know, you take on, I kind of think you change person one at a time. You know, and I'm going to share a quick story and then I'm going to bring somebody on to join our conversation. Um, I worked for a company, a club in Great Neck, New York, and I was the manager and I was the only one like this as a manager. I happened to hire a woman from Nigeria to teach. And one of the members came over to me one day and said, oh, my God, she was awesome. I've never taken a class from a black woman. And I, I you, you, what do you say to that? 
Um, hello, I've been running your company for three years. I am a black woman. What do you, what do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> but that's how, you know, and it was really because of one of, I don't think she meant to offend me, but she didn't look at me as a black woman or a black person. And then when I said, but you know, I'm black. And she's like, no, you're not like them. Oh. So again, it's about that whole stigmatism of yeah, uh, you know, we call it in our in our in our culture colorism. It starts that whole other conversation again, of you know, no, there's no difference. We're all the same. Well, it, it often ties into those sort of backhanded compliments that you realize were actually, I would say, most of them are just absolute ignorance to say mm -hmm. you know, and I hear this even in the PT world. I hang around with doctors, and they're like. I can't stand PTs and they look over at me and they go, but Anderson, you're different. I like you. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm a PT, you know, and, and when somebody says, oh, you know, you're really pretty for a black woman or something like that is an absolute mm -hmm. insult. But I, you know, they, they're not putting that together. They're not, you're all right for a white guy kind of thing, meaning that all other white guys aren't all right. You know, it's like that, that kind of ignorance and those backhanded compliments. And I just, you know, now the more the more aware we are, the more we hear those things and just think like, oh my gosh, can you know whether it's the gay community or just things that are said that you know are are thoughtless. And so you know, this is the kind of thing. And this brings us to another comment here from Kim. She says, I think one way of raising the awareness and inclusion of all people in Pilates is to start with the children of our world. If we could offer Pilates classes to the youth in areas where Pilates is not normally accessible then students can identify with the profession and see it as a possibility for a career choice. I'd love to hear what the panel thinks of this. So we can shift gears a little bit from Teresa to my question. Let's look for some solutions. Very great. Before we shift gears, I do want to bring on Sonia Herbert, um, yes. who is the founder of Black Girls Pilates. I know she's available. Um, and she's also someone that's doing a lot of work in the communities and increasing the awareness. Yeah. So. Recently, I connected with Sonia, and um, you know, I I love her style. She often um, asks to be uh, makes it very clear that she's going to call it a, a spade a spade and say the words the way she wants to, and and I love that about her and uh, her frankness and and uh, directness. So I think uh, Melissa's bringing her on now. So as she comes on, we'll enjoy having her join our panel. And as she's doing that, maybe we can maybe address Kim's comment while while uh, Sonia's coming on. Anybody have any thoughts on on that? Yeah, um, I think that comes with like I mentioned earlier earlier things being more accessible. So uh, let's say let's put it in a simple. I believe um, let's say Pilates anytime. We probably most of us have it. And I'm paying like what eighteen dollars a month. I was not able to afford that eighteen dollars a month as I was getting my certification because I'm still a student. I'm still working. You know, um, things like that could be lowering costs, cutting costs to things. You know, to serve the masses, to serve everyone, so that everybody can have access to stuff like that. And also, if you're a studio owner or manager or Pilates instructor yourself. Go reach out to your own community. Send out emails to educators around. Is there a dance program in the area that you want to offer Pilates and what that is? It's there. Do you maybe want to start a Pilates studio somewhere where there's a lack of what this is? Um, and that goes across all somatic practices. Just be, just like you reach out and send ads to get clients, go reach out and send ads to serve and support and be there. Thanks, Ken. So there were um, several initiatives brought out over the few years, and this is where I talk about sustainability and is it really, was it really their goal or was it just something they paraded around? One organization started um, a nurturing program for people in their lower communities. And I remember at one of the conferences, they brought the, the diverse children out and they did some Pilates for everybody and everybody thought it was cool. But we never saw that program really grow. And then I know another Pilates professional decided that that's what they were going to do, that they were going to start an organization and they were going to ask Pilates professionals, studio owners, 
to donate a certain amount of time to underserved communities so that they could also learn about Pilates and look at it as a career and benefit from it for health. And again, I, it, it wasn't, I'm, I'm talking about answers that are sustainable. You know, it's great when someone says, oh, we're gonna do this, this is great. And they, and I don't wanna say they, they march everybody out and it's good for a year and then it, right back and then yeah. we're gonna do this. And then they send out some newsletters, they do a big campaign and then it just, so, you know, how, again, one person at a time makes a difference, but how do we make it where it is sustainable continual not just like you know like i mentioned to ken in my conversation with him when this is over and everybody's back to what i call normal where is where is this going where are we going with this what is the plan where are we going to move forward and keep the momentum going you know hi sonia so Sonia, thank you for joining us. Sonia is the founder of Black Girl Pilates. She's co-founder of Mellon and Brothers of Pilates, yeah. Classical Pilates Rebel. She's an activist, anti-racist catalyst, a writer, disruptor, revolutionary activist. Oh. Still yeah, there, we there we go. Now there you can go. hear me. <laughs> um, and okay. this is dated the Angela to be Davis Fitness and Powerlifter. And so Sonia, I've been following you lately and and enjoying your podcast. I know that I'm not the ideal population for it, but I do want to listen and learn. And you have been um, a great leader amongst black women in Pilates. And I know that you're very well respected and welcome to the panel. Thank you for being available. Thank you. It's nice to meet all of you. Some of you I've never met or actually ever heard of, except for Stella, she's in my group. Um, I know you've been busy, and then um, and then Kenneth and I have been having offline conversations. Peter, it's very nice to meet you. And is it Demika? Yeah, did I say it correctly? It's very nice to meet you too. Um, so I just want to um, I want to go back to because I was listening to the conversation that you guys were having about I think there was a question um, about whether we wanted to be called people of color or or black people. Well. And then this is just me. I don't think I'm right about everything, but I think I'm right about a lot of things. Um, people, of, if you put me in in um, the same vein as a POC, then that means that I um, you're talking about everyone that has some color in their skin. But what we're talking about today is we're talking specifically about black people. And so black is a um, it is a, an umbrella for everything underneath it, whether you are uh, from the Caribbean, and my kids have a Caribbean father, so, but they're also American, that's cultural stuff. So you have your Caribbean, you have your folks who are Caribbean Latinos, you know, if we're going to say, uh, if we're gonna be talking about how, oh, well, uh, black has all these different cultures, it's a difficult thing to, you know, it's a difficult thing to just kind of put us in as black people, but, if that's the case, then you're gonna have to say, well, Sonia is black Texan, you know, this person's black New York and this person's <laughs> black this, you know, cause then like Stella was saying, you know, we don't ask white people like, you know, you're Irish this and cause we know we can't tell anyway, you know, cause you're white, I'm black, you know? So um, I am not a person of color. A person of color is someone who is non-black um, person of color. Like for instance, someone who is of Mexican descent. Um, like for instance, someone who is um, from the Mediterranean, depending on where they are in the Mediterranean, because there are some black people who are Mediterranean, right? Um, now, did we create a uh, race black or whatever? Absolutely not. We were in Africa just living our best life. <laughs> and then before we knew it, you know, here we were, and we have no culture and no names, and we're still trying to figure that out. And so um, folks also have to remember that um, America was not the only place that was colonized. Um, the Caribbean was colonized, which is why we have, you know, very handsome men like Peter and, you know, very handsome men like, like Kenneth. You know, the Caribbean was colonized as well by the British and the French uh, and the Spanish and, and all that kind of thing like that. So we're kind of everywhere, you know, and even in some other countries, we didn't even know that we were, were there, you know. So um, 
I don't want anybody. This is just me. I don't want and my kids too. I won't. I don't want anybody telling my kids that they're people of color because they're not. They're black, and I'm happy to be black. And so the reason why we're here is about black people because if you don't liberate us first, then you can't liberate any of the other um, non-black people of color because the most hated race in the world is black people. And so if we're gonna call a spade a spade, let's go ahead and call it that. Um, when we're talking about things that um, the Pilates community um, should be doing, the first thing that they need to do is um, work on their own individual inherent racism. You have to, it's like, and this is the analogy that I use. So we're talking about, um, if you take like an alcoholic, I used to be in social work for a very long time. Um, you take someone who is an alcoholic. Um, the first thing that they have to do is they have to admit that they're an alcoholic. Otherwise, there's nothing that they can do. They're just gonna be out there doing what they do, right? So you admit that you're an alcoholic. Okay, so now I've admitted that. I know that I have a problem. How do I, how do I work on this problem? I Google. I figure out where's my resources. Who are the people that can that can help me? I find those resources. I find those people, and then I start using them. And as I go throughout my life, I know I'm going to fall. There's going to be triggers. I'm probably going to start drinking again, or maybe not. You know, there's going to be. It's a lifetime of trying to get through all of this stuff that has been built in your life. So it's not about. Um, I mean, it's not about program initiatives and stuff like that. I mean, how many programs do we know that are for black people? There's a lot of them, um, you know, but we don't need any more programs. I'm not saying don't have any other programs, but what I'm saying is, is that as individuals, as individual white people, you have to own your own individual um, fault in what's going on now. So once you do that, because the, the um, an organization is only as good as its top person. Mm -hmm. So the top, the bottom is only going to look like the top. So you have to start um, with the very top people. And then the other thing I want to, I want to mention is that um, why these programs and putting me everywhere, pulling Stella here and Kent there and blah, 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 is not going to work is, um, okay, I was actually on a good good roll here. <laughs> Menopause is crazy, y'all. Um, I'm in it, I'm in it. it. Yes, <laughs> you understand, right, Stella? Um, I totally. Let me see, what was I saying? What was I saying? Uh, I was talking about how um, um, the, oh, systems. So we're talking about systemic racism, right? So systemic racism is a system. When, um, when America was taken from the indigenous people, and colonized, they created a system so that white people could function underneath that system. That system is still apparent today. You could put um, you could put Stella, me, and Kenneth at the very top of Polestar, but you know what? It's not going to change anything because your system's still the same. The mm -hmm. system is still going to be against me, Stella, and Kenneth. And so, if we have to work underneath that system. Um, then we're going to end up being anti-black against our own self. Because how can yeah. I function in a system that's not made for me? So you have to dis you have to dismantle the system and let us come in and say, okay, you know, here's what's going to happen. And I know it sounds like a big a big thing, but it is. But we didn't we also didn't um, we didn't build it. Okay. So Sonia, I wanna I wanna pass the mic over to Kenneth because Kenneth had brought up some points as well and and talking about the Pilates in general of, you know, here we are doing a method that was created by a white guy a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're staying within this framework. And Kenneth, you got some thoughts on that. I thought, you know, along the lines of what yeah. Simon's talking about. Um, well, I have a background in dance, so I had to train a lot with um, classical ballet, right? And so naturally mm -hmm. I fell into Pilates. And the thing is, uh, the thing about Pilates is, yes, we are following the sayings and repertoire and movement patterns of uh, white men in the early 20th centuries. And my thought in that same thing as in ballet, unless we trip away from keeping such tradition and being too traditional in what that is, we're not going to see any progress or evolution into what the method is. That means giving platforms for people at the, like Tamika to put in her knowledge and 
um, you know, physical therapy and her new um, doings and creative outlets that she can bring into the into the Pilates world by adding her own point of view. Um, same thing with Sonja, like, what are they doing in that studio? I want to know what's happening down there. How is she teaching? Um, letting people that, that her employees and herself have a platform where they, she can show how she does things. It is a matter of putting um, leadership, not just putting um, black people of color and black people at the top, it's also a matter of giving them um, and giving us as well that power to say, this is how we're gonna do things now and this mm -hmm. is how it's gonna happen. Um, and that comes with a lot, that comes with the way that we speak as we're teaching, um, the way that we dress or walk and talk into places, it's a matter of just, you know, the way that some people give you a um, cue mm -hmm. sometimes. It's like, why, are we, why is everything so plain vanilla? Where it could be rich, beautiful chocolate, you know? Um, so it's about just changing language, changing the, the, the way things are done. Like she said, that system. Um, making room for creativity and new nuance and new beginnings. Tamika, in physical therapy, would you, you know, sort of see and resonate with that? I mean, you know, basically physical therapy is primarily Northern European and, you know, the, the whole construct of it for, you know, almost a century now has been primarily white based and, and there is not a lot of physical therapy really reaching into the black communities. What would be something that you would see bringing to this, I think the thing is we got to start thinking of constructive, collaborative ways to do this. So it's like, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing is like, hey, let's let's break some things down and let's look at the reconstruction of, of some of these things and let us be the leader in the sense of me as a white person opening the door to say, come in and let's reconstruct this. You know, what do you see? What what would be different? What would be what needs to change? in the infrastructure of some of these organizations? Well, from my point of view, um, when I worked as a physical therapy tech before getting into school, um, I worked in a predominantly white area, the village, Flor the villages, Florida, anyone who knows. So, you know, we didn't see many black people. And what was alarming to me is when we did see black people, they weren't really convinced that physical therapy could positively affect them. Like I was working with a black, black lady one time helping her with her balance and she looks over to me and she said, you don't really think this is going to work? So for me, starting my career in physical therapy, it's um, one of my goals is to actually be there for Black people to give them resources and let them know, like, this is stuff that works. Like, you have to speak to them. And even a lot of the issues that people have, Black people have, because of the lack of resources, they could easily, not easily, but be solved by just educating them, you know, simply stretching or doing certain exercises can help you preserve your back and then you wouldn't be here in this situation. So for me, I mean, you know, my goal is to have a profession and um, make money and all of that, but I really hope that I can like go out into like my community or, you know, any community that has a lot of black people and just educate them, give them groundwork to actually, you know, make their life better. I want them to be healthy, whether they have to come see me or not. You know, if, if you don't have to come see me, I'd be happier. But I want them to actually trust the field and actually um, have faith in us. And like I said, I think, you know, once you see someone who looks like you, then your guard is automatically down to start, you know, chipping away at whatever you think isn't possible or you know, whether you think therapy will work or not. So that's why I'm I'm so happy to be in this group today. You know, I'm taking mental notes and physical notes too, um, on ways that I can help black people like be healthier and better and you know, just so that we can kind of chip away at that stereotype that we are always the group that is, you know, more prone to disease or more prone to this or that. It comes with educating them and not necessarily speaking with them when it's too late, but talking to them before they get to that point so that we don't have to act on um, I have another guest that's going to join us. Patricia Muse is a physical therapist and Pilates teacher in the D.C. area, so she comes on. I'd like to welcome her on. Peter, while we're waiting for Patricia to come on, any thoughts along the discussion we've been having here of 
the idea of, of increasing the awareness. I think you and I have talked a lot about that, but how do we how do we increase the awareness in the community, in the institutions? Um, well, you know. I think the awareness um, that I would start with is recognizing that everybody suffers trauma and and the trauma is become institutionalized. And um, I think it was uh, Sonja who said something about the individual maybe being uh, the person we start with in terms of addressing their own racism. Um, oftentimes, people don't know they have trauma. They don't recognize the emotion that came with that trauma. And I, I suspect that racism is a trauma that the individual doesn't recognize in themselves. And so oftentimes, somebody white will say to you, I'm not racist. I don't do racist things. I don't have racist thoughts. That's because they don't recognize their own emotions. They don't recognize their own institutional systemic trauma. The trauma that comes from their family's attitudes towards black, African Americans, slavery, um, self absorbed um, entitlement and privilege. You know, none of that is clear to them. So there's no acknowledgement that I'm a racist person. And um, so when I speak of awareness of the conversations we've had, Brent, it's to try to get people to realize the emotions behind the trauma of racism that they themselves individually carry and they may not even recognize. You know, attitudes, perceptions, and it starts there. That kind of self-reflection might help the next time you have a conversation with somebody. When we were talking about how do you want to be called black or people of color, to be honest with everybody, I thought to myself, well, I'd like to be called Peter. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've always called you. <laughs> Hey, there are a couple of questions here while we're waiting that I think come along in this line and this sort of in the same breath. Murat from uh, from Turkey uh, made a comment. He says, we must become a little colorblind in order to see for a glass of dignity, glasses of dignity, see the person in thoughts before any color and appearance. And, you know, I know that that's often a comment that's made. <clears throat> And I heard a talk the other day, it's double shit in her head, and so I just got a big grin on her face. Yeah. And um, it was uh, It's a it grin of disagreement. <laughs> no, I want people to know that I'm black. I want people to see beauty in my blackness. And, and you know, here's the so thing I'm, is that, um, and I, you know, I mean, I, I totally get what Peter's saying. I think that as black people, like, of course, like, yeah, see me as Sonia. Um, I wish that that was actually the thing, but it's not. <laughs> um, and but um, for me, like I'm totally okay with like, you know, I want you to see my blackness. That's why I have on Africa, you know, because I I love being black. I think that we are the best race in the whole wide world. We love everybody. I mean, we have been lynched and hung and hit with I don't know how many bullets. But yet we still get up and we still rise and we still go and we still do our jobs and stuff like that. And, you know, it's so easy to, you know, give this whole like colorblind thing. Like, listen, why? First of all, if you're colorblind, you can't see my my yellow shirt. So that's going to be so you want everything to be in black and white. You know, that's not how this universe was made. So that's just not going to happen if colorblind really worked we wouldn't be here in having this conversation today. Obviously it does not work and no one's going to be colorblind. And I know for me, I damn sure ain't going to act like I'm not black because I love being black. So, you know, I don't know what to tell him. I think I know who, uh, who Marat is. Um, he's quite an incredible teacher, but you right. know, that's yeah. just not how things it, are going this, to be solved. This is the dialogue that has to happen, right? Because I think we create these, as Peter was talking about, of saying, I, I'm not racist, you know? I have friends that are black. I mean, what does that mean? You know, it's like- not a cliche. Right, right, <laughs> so, exactly, yeah. exactly. This is the language that we want to start 
you know, breaking down these patterns. And we, yeah, we're all at the end, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Unless you have to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're overloading the system with too much energy. There's some good energy here. Um, let yeah. me let me share another thought here from Del. You want to take a comment? Go for it. Yeah. So you know it's interesting because I find um, non-black people, just to put it out there, are the first ones to say um, the world should not be seen in color. <laughs> and it, it, and it, it's interesting it's because <laughs> they do not walk into a room. And, you know, Peter said, I want to be known as Peter. I know Peter, can, all of us have walked into a room and the first thing they notice is our color. <laughs> but if you walk into a room, Brent, they, it's, that's where the colorblind exists. I'm so boring. That's where the color, that's where it doesn't work. That's where it works. It works mm -hmm. in your favor, mm -hmm. but it right. doesn't, it never works in ours. It's the first thing they mm -hmm. see when I walk in the room is, oh, you're black. And then the second thing is, you're a black woman who's in this room. Should I be scared? So it's, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, for someone to sit around and go, oh, we're colorblind. Yeah, that works for people <laughs> who are not black. <laughs> right. I think another, another way for, I think white people are very uncomfortable with acknowledging that they do not want to deal with racism like at all. It doesn't affect mm -hmm. them, so they don't want to deal with it. I was having a conversation in my class the other day about ethics and stuff. And I asked my teachers, like, do you think it's an appropriate question or how would you handle an interview asking you, how would you deal with the racial issue in terms of a patient being blatantly racist towards a, um, a physical therapist? And my teacher, this my white teacher, this lady said, well, it's kind of like, if you ask that, if, if, if you're looking for something, you'll find it. Hmm. And I was, I had to mute my mic. I didn't want to disrespect her. I've never met her in person, but I was like, you don't go out looking for racism. I think that he's like being ignorant on purpose. I've had people like in working that will say, I will not work with you because you are black. Never met, didn't, didn't let me, didn't let me treat them or work with them at mm -hmm. all. They looked at me and said, mm -hmm. I don't want to work with the black girl. But I think also we have to realize that racism is like we start to compartmentalize um, specific words like racism. Um, it is broad and you can walk back and forth. Racism is not the person with the hood on their head or the person who's walking with a tiki torch. It is the per it is the white person sitting right in front of me. It is my client who is on on the Cadillac. That's that's what racism is. And folks think that you have to be, you know, like spewing all of this, you know, racial vitriol and all this kind of stuff like that. And that is not true. So it is very broad. And white people walk between, they'll, they can go from here to a thousand or from a thousand to zero. And so it's not, there's no, um, there's no box. There's no box you can check to say racist, sort of kind of racist, maybe racist, probably not racist. I'm about to think about racist. There's none of that. You either are or you're not. And you play within that sandbox of racism. That's how I see it. I think I'm right most of the time. <laughs> but yeah. oh, Peter, I just want to let you know that Patricia's on. We can't put her on in video, but she is on in sound. So um, I just introduced Patricia real quick. I mentioned she's a PT and in uh, DC area and went through the Pulsar training years ago and practiced Pilates and fitness and um, also has, you know, some contributions to make this. So Peter, back to you, do you have a comment? Yeah, I want to put this out to the panel. Um, what do you, what are the things that you see that are racism around you in your studios, in the work that you do? What, 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 for the, for the benefit of the audience, what experiences do you have that are racism? Hmm. <laughs> in relation to our profession or in our personal lives, um, I, narrow I was, it down. I was, I was <laughs> Give us thinking a profession because we have a professional audience, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking, and help me along with this, that again, I don't think people in general realize 
what racism is. Right. Maybe a couple okay. of examples um, I help yeah. them kind of put it in context. I can I think I have an experience. Um I used to work for a company in New York as a educator for Pilates. And I we had a contract with a studio in Smithtown. And they asked me to go out there to teach because I lived on Long Island and it was like, hey, you can go there. So I'm sitting in a cafe, you know, before the class, organizing my notes and everything else like that. No one paid me any mind, but I'm sitting there and they're talking about Stella. And they're going, oh, she used to dance professionally. She did this. She did that. Oh, my God. She must be awesome. Then somebody pulled up my picture. And all of a sudden, the conversation trained. Wait a minute. She's black? She's teaching us? How can she teach us? She doesn't know Pilates. And all. So, you know, just sitting there. So, you know, I didn't say anything. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to let my work speak for myself. And when we got into the classroom and I was Stella walking into the room, you know, you could see people's faces trying not to change because, you know, they're like, oh, I, I know I said this about her while she was sitting over there. I didn't know that was you. Or, you know, one or two people tried to apologize. I wouldn't accept it. I'm like, no, you said what you felt. You can't take that back. You can't change it. So, you know, from a profession, that's how I was introduced in the Pilates as a professional mentor by people that I thought would, you know, hey, you 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 were given this job because you qualified. And until they knew I was black, I was they were excited to meet me. Here's the thing. Once you get the job, all the microaggressions that come within that. I had the new front desk girl lock the door on me because she didn't know I was a teacher. I've had, I found out that I make less than someone that just jumped in into the studio and he happens to be white. I've, you know, there's, there's so many things that happen. Like clients, like Tamika said earlier, saying, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to take his class. I don't want him to be my teacher. No. And not having a concrete answer as of why that's not a thing. It's a matter of your staff coming to the studio manager, coming to the owner saying, hey, this situation happened and you put in the client first before the people that are working for you. So there's many things that have, you know, there's many, many way of racism. Like I remember once um, someone said this, this was towards my immigration status. So I had a client we were teaching um, people next to each other. It's very small studio, New York City. And we're whispering among the instructors because we can't be too loud. And this one guy comes up, this is 6.30 a.m. by the way, like I already sacrificed my ass to be here for you. So I just want some <laughs> respect. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he's just like, um, can you speak a little louder? Like, is this English? This is America. And I'm like, what? So what do I do? I go to management and I say, this is, this happened. This needs to be fixed. What does manager, the manager does? Sends her over to a different instructor. And it happens in many forms. It's like, oh, I don't want to deal with this problem. Okay, why don't you teach her? No, you have the power to cancel that client. You have the power to be like, this is unacceptable. We're not going to tolerate this in our studio and our practices. Um, so it's a matter of putting your own, putting money aside, putting clients aside, and making sure that you're taking care of your employees, your staff, and uh, of, of all, just having a good um, ethical business. That's a really good point. Yeah. Brent, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Trisha. It's Trish, yeah. I think that um, in terms of experiencing racism, whether it's the implicit or explicit, um, and as Sonia said before, almost sometimes the scarier part is the person sitting in front of you pretending to be one way, that 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 quiet, you know, that's, that's right there can be the scariest. But, you know, you go to call a patient back and, you know, you call them by their name and say, come on back. And when they either get up and turn the corner or approach you, they go, oh, is the therapist coming soon? You're taking me back to the room? Something inside them says, you couldn't possibly be the therapist, right? right? Now, you know, I'm not trying to like make excuses. Okay, yeah, a lot of times when we go to a physician's office, oftentimes the physician is not the one to bring us back. So, you know, that kind of, 
ties in. They assume a nurse is bringing them back in the physician's office, so I couldn't possibly be the physical therapist. But as soon as they turn the corner, usually my hand is extended, and I go, hi, my name is Trish. I'm your physical therapist today. The shock, you know, of all. So then there are some come back and you establish, you know, a, a warm relationship and you're able to really you know, do it, do what you want to do and do what you need to do and have the patient feel comfortable and you feel mm -hmm. comfortable, you know, and then also, you know, as you also try to explore whether or not there are any objections. And by objections, I mean like this day is appropriate, you know, is a good time for you, is a good day for you to come for physical therapy. This time is a good time for you. So, you know, to make sure, because we always, you know, we're cutting down no-shows and cancellations and things like that for patients. And then, you know, making sure, you know, everything like insurance is covered, you know, everything is fine. So they raise no objections and poof, they disappear. They're miraculously healed and never <laughs> show up again. Right, never come back. Yeah. We experience it, experience it in different ways. I experience it right in the clinic where I was working I've noticed that sometimes you just don't, you aren't given or do not have, your your opinion is not weighted the same as someone else's. I was explaining to Brent when we spoke um, a couple of days ago, like wanting to bring in Pilates reformer and educate, well, you're the only one. We we're not going to expend that, you know, amount of money for that because I can't be the one who teaches them. So... I'm CSCS certified. I've done every fitness certification there is, you know, master's in physical therapy, started the doctor of science in PT, come with a pre-med degree from Penn State. Like what other qualification could you possibly want? And so slowly by slowly, the last three hires in our clinic were one, two, three, four Caucasian women. So I am the only clinician. I, um, you know, in terms of just being able to introduce different things into the clinic, it, it simply can't come for me. Like we, it was some one of my other friends that was on the staff who was African American female went through it too. I mean, she was she was a basketball player, so clearly she's going to be taller than fun size me, bigger than fun <laughs> size me, right? And with that being said, you know, if she said anything, it had to be construed as militant. And they consistently did not give her the clinic manager mm -hmm. job. She mm -hmm. left to take a clinic manager job. They complained that she that she didn't give them enough notice and they had 30 days. Wow. And if they want to get rid of us, they're not gonna wait 30 days to get rid of us. Like mm -hmm. they couldn't be doing enough. That and so to true. that end, where we had so much, so much diversity in our clinic. We had a therapist who was Filipino. We had a therapist who was Indian. There were two of us that were African American, and I say African American because it's like the long story of everything that's with me. <laughs> Grandparents. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a story. My grandfather was Cuban. I mean, all all the other. Um, so, to so all that being said, slowly I'm the last one standing. Hmm. So they celebrate everything else, you know, like Taco Tuesday is a big thing that comes in there, but not, they are doing bulletin boards. They put up Christmas, they put up Thanksgiving. They've never mm. acknowledged Hanukkah, Chanaka. They have never acknowledged other cultures and have certainly never put up anything with regards to Black History Month. We are sitting, I graduated from Howard. We're sitting less than 20 miles from Howard. And I had the last Howard student. You're part-time, you can't do a student. I'm like, I've split a student before. It's because I'm working part-time, split a student before. They're like, there's a physical therapy shortage in Virginia. I'm like, really? Because you're surrounded by GW, Marymount and Howard. ODU in Norfolk and Hampton has a program. So I think I probably named five schools within three hours or less of you. Raise my hand and Stephanie, have you spoken to Howard? No, I mean, we don't hear anything from them. And so yeah, we, 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 
be all different kinds from the patient who's like, you're the therapist to someone that doesn't ask that question and just doesn't show up again to even management that does not foster a relationship with programs, HBCUs that have PT programs. Hmm. Interesting. We're, we're, I just want to give a time check. We're over time, but I don't want to stop it. I know that Stella has a real hard stop, so I know that she's got to get off in a minute or two. Um, if you want to continue the conversation for a few more minutes, I'd like to have some wrap up to it and some real actionable items, which I've heard. And if I heard right, I'm going to repeat things back to you in a little bit and you'll, you'll let me know if, if I heard them right. And if I did, you can put a thumbs up. If I didn't, you can correct me, right? Because what we want to do is get this message out. We're going to put it in print. We're going, this video is going to be made. You'll all get copies of it. You can share it with ever, whoever you want. Um, this is all free. It's the idea is to disseminate information. Peter, you had a comment? Well, I wanted to try to get um, feed off of what Ken said about the systemic nature of this and within Polestar Pilates, what can we act to do today? Because act is the last part of the title to this session. Mm -hmm. And I think Stella had one idea, so I'm glad you didn't leave yet. And, um, you know, just what, what can we suggest as a panel to people out there in the audience who have Polestar Studios or our physical therapists and are encountering the racism that was just you know, we just gave a few examples of. How do you change that systemically? What actions can we take? You know, if you don't mind, Ben, did you want to read some of your points or do you want me to read some of your points? You can go ahead and read them. <laughs> I'd rather you read them, but if you don't, I'm going to... Um, I think some of the main things will be... Um, let me just pull it out right now. Um, first of all, like I said, opening room for movement generation and invention so that there's new ways of teaching. I believe also hiring and um, more black people to be at your studio if it's possible. And if you run a certification program, um, giving them accessibility to what the program is, whether it is by generating scholarships for that, there could be more people um, who are black or people of color as well, teaching this because they don't have the resources. Um, I think it's also, like I mentioned early, it comes to going, sticking out within your own community to see what's missing, to see where you can put in your work, planting little seeds of, um, I call it little seeds of um, activism, you know, saying the word. And also, a lot of us probably teach one-on-one -on -one private clients. You need to be aware that as a Pilates instructor or as a medical practitioner, they are listening to you. You can take the opportunity to simply say things like, hey, this is wrong. Hey, this is what's happening right now. You get that one app personal hour with a client, they're there for you. And if they like you, you can have conversation with them, which I'm sure you do. But instead of going on about talking about the margaritas, why don't pull up a real lifetime conversation <laughs> and say, hey, this is what's up. Um, so it's a matter of just making, taking um, action into your own hands and just trying to make a change as much as you can. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. All right. So can I read back some of the things I heard? And you can, I know Stella's got to jump off. And if there are a few more questions or something, we could talk about it. But um, the, the whole goal of today was to listen and learn and then have each of items, even if it's a beginning. And the first one I heard very loud and clear is to admit that we're racist. I think that, you know, that we that we all have this racism in us. We have the construct that um, was built. And it's not necessarily our fault that we're racist. It's our fault if we keep perpetuating the racism. So the idea is that if you were raised with racism or raised with ways of and you realize right now that you're hearing that those actions, those thoughts, those behaviors that were just shared, that you witnessed them and that you've been part of them or that I've been part of them is to make that decision right now that, you know, I'm going to change. I'm going to become aware, as Sonia said, you know, my name is Brent, I'm a racist and I'm looking for help and I'm looking to learn. And if I fall down, 
don't kick me, help pick me up and teach me the right thing to say, the right thing to do, but that I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do that. So that was number one. Oh, also, I want you to make it clear that, um, make it clear that you're, that white people, black people cannot be racist. So I don't want it to, I don't want people to, to go and be like, oh, everybody's racist. That's not, that's not true. So just, I just want to make it clear to our audience that it's white people that we're talking about. That's why we're here. I cannot, none of the rest of us can be racist. White people can be racist. And also non-black people of color can be racist against black people. So black people cannot race, be racist. I just want to make that clear. So people won't okay. be like, oh. You know? on that, as far as that comment from Sanja, because that's an interesting one. Because there's one of the questions in here that was, is there prejudice amongst, and prejudice is different than racism. But is there prejudice amongst the black community within itself? That's something. That's not a question that we should be talking about. No. no. That's, yeah. That's a question. Lines. That's between. That's, that's our black question. Community. Yeah. Right. That's our Thank question, Stella. not your question. That's right. Yeah. So here's some things. That we <laughs> Thank you, Stella. <laughs> I'm going. Yeah. That's one. Oh no, no, no. We're not going to do that yeah. one. I saw. I yeah. saw. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's ours. We'll talk about that in. We, could fix, we, we will fix ourselves yeah. when we get mm -hmm. other things done. That's <laughs> when you're right. Working with your siblings, mm -hmm. y'all don't argue in public, you fix it when you get home. Right, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so here's, exactly. here's the yes. action items that I have in here. Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, have the courage to fire clients <clears throat> that are manifesting racist behavior. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Number Big two, one. support staff no matter what. Right. Right. So I have black staff and I know that, you know, if I got to do a better job and I got to evaluate what's going on, that I do that. Um, I think Ken, you brought up a really good one is that if anybody's discriminating on pay based on color, shame on you, fix it today. Change it today. Make it right. Mm -hmm. Ken needs a raise. You need to make sure that, that, you know, the job description has a pay scale and that pay scale doesn't matter if you're black, female, gay, old, young, you know, what the pace scale is. You've got to be hey, Brent. Hey, Brent. Yeah. And in terms of, like you said, you know, if you have um, someone African American, you know, that's working, is having that opportunity for them to shine and not be in the background to check a box. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. It's not a quota. Right. You know, and I, um, I can say that I have I have some amazing employees. And teachers and educators around the country that, um, and I think we can even do a better job. So we will, we will do a better job of that. That, um, allows, never... that allows other people to see their value. That yeah. client that starts to question, never worked with them before. Can I work with them? Are they very good? Or I don't. When everyone's like, you know, in the picture from another, but I don't see them. See, some of that puts forth that doubt. If yeah. you know. There, there's the racism that's there, and then there's also kind of questioning what the world kind of tells them that we cannot do, but we have to have the opportunity to show that. Yeah, thank you, Trish. I think the one of the big ones I took down is, um, you know, to educate <clears throat> also not just dealing with, um, not to make assumptions. I think this is the key is, you know, this is an education process. I've heard somebody talk on a show the other day that I was listening to, and he said, like, <clears throat> you need to be able to differentiate between a black man that is safe and a black man that might be harmful, just like you have to do a white man that's safe and harmful. How do you do that? Well, you have to get to know the people. You have to break down the walls. You have to communicate. If you're making the judgment thinking that because they're black, they're dangerous, <clears throat> then you're making an assumption that's absolutely incorrect. And um, he was talking about a book he had just written. I can't remember the name of it. And I apologize for the research, but it was on kindness. And he was uh, saying that we need to make the assumption that everybody is kind until it has been proven otherwise. And that from that process, the two or three times that we get conned or burned or injured, that our, our own body starts to build a way of understanding how to differentiate that. But the assumption is that everybody is kind. And everybody is good and therefore you eliminate that process without having to eliminate the color or the culture or the religion or the 
sexual preference. So that was the assumption one. Um, and a couple things came up to me. One was somebody had mentioned Kim had talked about, you know, getting into the school systems and making sure it's being taught in school systems. And I'm thinking my youngest daughter just took a job um, as an art teacher in a school district that has a, a high minority percentage and is thought to be underprivileged school and she's going to be an art teacher and she also teaches Pilates. And, you know, that kind of idea of being able to offer the classes in the schools, getting exposure, encouraging people to do something that's more sustainable, as you mentioned, Stella, that we have to look for sustainable exposure and recognition in the community itself and that we need to make that a high priority. Uh, make Can we also um, just, you know, and maybe I'll, maybe this is something I'll have to throw in my webinar um, with the Pilates studios and instructors is, um, I'm not a minority. Um, I'm also not, I mean, are, are we marginalized or something? Yes. Are we, you know, underprivileged? And so, I think that's also a language that we as black people have to start putting on ourselves, but I definitely want um, the white community to stop um, telling us who they think that we are, because that's not who I am. And a lot of us, some of us didn't come from underprivileged families. You know, some of them, some of them came, you know, now my family was a bit poor or whatever, but you know, for all I know, Stella probably came from a lot of money. That Not a lot. Lives. My mom worked three jobs. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, we don't know that. And so, you know, if you're talking about going into, um, like, okay, let's let's um, take the programs, let's let's take the programs into into uh, black and brown communities, you know, where those programs don't exist, versus like marginalized minority, uh, what other names that they call us, those names have become derogatory, at least to me, I'm just saying that, but um, I don't see myself, I see myself as a very strong black woman, I'm educated, you know, I know what the hell I'm talking about, I'm not marginalized, I'm not a minority, I'm a majority at this point. Disadvantage is the one that bugs me, but disadvantage. And I'm not disadvantaged either. Yeah, That's I like am your advantage. <laughs> Physical therapy, right? And we worked well, think about it, we worked really hard to get away from the language of handicapped and disabled, even though we use it to some extent. It's, you know, you have an impairment, but, you know, I have patients that far exceed anything you can imagine with incredible difficulty in, you know, mm -hmm. no arms, no legs. Rocket Bob, man, he skis like a fiend, owns a multi-million dollar company and gets escorted everywhere he goes in a beautiful 740 BMW. And if you told him he was handicapped, he would laugh at you because he lives life to the fullest. There's nothing handicapped about Rocket Bob. Um, another story why we call him Rocket Bob. But uh, <laughs> the point is, is that you know I appreciate that we need the we need the education on the language. You know, it needs to be, and this is a sensitive topic. It's probably for another day. But if we were to, as Ken said, you know, make available things like scholarships or to waive initiation fees for um, a franchise to be put into a community. You know, how does that, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is there a way to do it that is tasteful, that has dignity? And what would that look like? And I think that needs to be another discussion of ours in the future. But I think we need to address that because there's people who want to put money, Stella said 15% that we could put towards something that is, you know, whether it's hiring, educating, exposing, increasing awareness, that that we got to look at. And those were the main um, things I took away. I think from socialization, things about, you know, backhanded comments, like making, you know, I think this is where we need to be called on this. So, right. you know, if somebody comes up and touches your hair, uh no, 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 I, I know. I, I mean, I didn't tell you my story, but I mean, I grew up, my high school was 75% black. And, you know, you learn very quickly what's cool, what's not cool, right? But I remember, right. you know, um, having a good friend and a woman came up and started squishing her hair in line, like some random woman, at, you know, at a Burger King. And so my friend turned around and started squishing her, you know, all fancy white hairdo. And the woman was absolutely shocked. Like, why would you touch my hair? 
And she goes, oh, I thought we were playing this game. Like you touch my hair, I touch your hair. She was, you know, it's like this ignorance they exist. I remember how offended she was, and it was like, and I was offended, embarrassed more than anything. I was embarrassed. But thinking of, you know, this is it needs now to become aware that when we see those behaviors, they need to be addressed. And I, what I would like to say is that, you know, again, it has to be addressed. It can be addressed in kindness, and it can be addressed as education, right. and that it is not acceptable. This is not acceptable language. These are not acceptable comments. Think about what you just said. This is where neurolinguistics comes in. And it's sort of like, do you realize what you just assumed by making that comment? Do you even, realize let even, let even go a little deeper in terms of what boundary, there's a different boundary oftentimes that they apply for one group than mm -hmm. for us. So how it's yeah. almost like, yeah. You know, like an animal, people will think an animal is below us, so I can do whatever I want to do to you because there's a different value associated with that and a different boundary. So, but it's almost like before they even get to can think of like, can you think of what you just said? It's almost like there's, you, you see that very differently and something inherently inside of you said that you had permission to do that. Yeah, yeah. Listen, we are out of time, and I want to thank. I, mean, I now I owe Rella a whole bottle of scotch. Uh, <laughs> but what I'd like to do is each of you to go around and just one final short comment that you'd like to share, and we'll close with your words, not mine. And uh, maybe Stella, I know you got to get off. If you could be the first one, I know your pearl of wisdom. I'd like to be towards the end, but um, I know you got to go. So I was gonna say, I'm. I, if we're gonna do a roundup, I'll be last and I'll, I'll let everybody else go first. Okay, you good with that? I'm good, it's, yeah, we got a few more minutes, I'll be last. Tricia, you wanna give us uh, a take home message? I'm hopeful because this is a place to start. And so next comes the action. We, we've got that common mind that we need to do something and that's why we're all here. And I can't wait for the next step, I'm hopeful. Well, we're going to keep it going. So, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I want you to hold me to it. So I know Sanjay, she's already looking at me like, I'm going to hold you, set you to this. Hold on. So I'm giving you permission. Thank you, Trish. Thanks for joining us in the last few minutes. Appreciate Thank you comment. for having me. Tamika, anything you'd like to, to share with the audience? Well, I just want to say, I know probably a lot of people who are listening are not African American or Black, um, but um, <laughs> like Dr. Anderson asked me, what can you do? And the first thing that you need to do is to actually realize and, you know, like try to examine what you're doing wrong or what you're doing that can And so this is your everyday life, you know, when you're speaking with a black person or something, just be more familiar with them or just try to examine what, what you're doing in your life that can be taken wrong or is racist and try to correct that. That's the first step. And then you can try to correct your peers and your family and we'll hopefully get somewhere with that. Thank you, Tamika. I love your spirit, and I'm, I'm really excited for your future. Yeah. I guess I'm Kenneth. next. <laughs> I think um, Kenneth is, I'm gonna have Kenneth go next. I'm saving yeah. you some. Um, <laughs> um, well, above all, I hope that this expands in not just into this organization, which I'm glad it's happening, but also other ones like the Pilates Method Alliance or Pilates any kind, things that are really have the power and have the representation of what Pilates is. Um, and then also these stories can, I'm gonna promote the art world now, these stories can be learned and can be, um, you can access uh, and gain history even through art and dance and books and movies. There are resources out there for you to look at, to understand a little deeper and better of the things that we're going through. And that way it doesn't catch you as a surprise. And that way that not some conscious self of yours is able to take a moment, pause, breathe, listen, learn, and then speak your mind out. Thank you, Kenneth. And you met, you brought up something I thought of. And one thing I heard is that we really need to incorporate current diversity training from the black community into our organization, into our education.
education to every student that goes through to every studio as part of the policy. So um, that's another on the on the to do that we can do immediately. Um, Sanja, tell us. Um, so my first thing is um, I just want my questions answered. I want to know where have you been? Uh, why are you showing up now? Um, and what are you going to do? Because I'll be watching um, yeah. all of the organizations um, and stuff like that. So, you know, if I see things starting to take a drop, then that tells me a lot about your organization. Um, and that means, you know, I have to kind of like talk to my sisters and my brothers and be like, okay, so what's, what are we going to do? So they're not, they're not doing anything. Do you still want to stay in that organization? And if you do, you let me know. And then we will, um, we'll go and talk to that organization and say, okay, you know, I know it's like three months later, but we're still black and we're still being killed, you know, at an enormous rate as usual. Um, so what's, you know, so what's going to, what's going to happen? And then the second thing I want to say is um, that um, developing an anti-racism plan is what they all need. Polestar. Power Pilates, my certification, Romanos Pilates, all of them, that's what they need. Diversity and inclusion <clears throat> is, I've been to that. <laughs> you know, I did that as a social worker because I worked, I worked with so many different types of people. And diversity is, again, a broad term. Racism is not a broad term like that. So um, what needs to happen or what I expect to see is um, anti-racism plans developed for the um, for those specific um, organizations, whether it's having me come in or some of my many friends that you can Google and find out about um, having them come in and, and doing those with you and keeping you accountable. That's Thank it. You for the correction on that. Mm -hmm. So we will we will not only have diversity, but we will have anti racism. I'll be talking to you. Peter. Yeah, I the only thing I, there's an incredible opportunity because of the paradigm and because of the recent events, um, the unfortunate demise of George Floyd and protests. But there's an incredible opportunity at this time in our history, and nothing needs to return to the norm. There's like a blank slate opportunity that anybody in any profession can take advantage of right now. So. I would highly encourage the audience to do, to make some changes that maybe before you wouldn't have even considered um, and, and be comfortable with the change. Change is a constant. So just move into change, let it flow. And let yourself let go of some of those very deep emotional scars that are the racism that you express towards black people. Um, Acknowledge it, recognize you have it, you hold it, and take this time to tell yourself, well, I'm ready to let go and, and move on. Move on into a, a world that's much more peaceful and where there's more equality and just a hell of a lot more caring for other fellow human beings. Thank you, Stephen. All right, Stella, my dear friend. Okay. Um, so Brent, I, you know when I when we first talked about this, discussed it together, my main point was what's going to happen when the spotlight is gone? So yes, I'm also going to be like Sonia. I am going to be holding everybody accountable. I'm going to be, you know, I see everything. I just don't comment all the time, but I do see. Um, and I do want, I want to challenge uh, the listeners and people that are going to get this copy later and however we distribute it, I want them to challenge their own thinking process. What do they think when they see somebody that is black? What is the first thought? Because if you trust your gut and the first thought you see is, oh my God, I'm scared of that person then that, that's the thought you need to start changing. That's, that's how it starts. Because you have to reflect. You have to spend time reflecting, looking at your behaviors. All of us are movement specialists here. We know that 
in order for a movement to change, you first have to recognize there's a problem in your movement. So for anybody to make a change, they have to recognize there is something in their thought. It's whether it's embedded, whether it's taught, whether it's seen, whatever message they're receiving, they have to recognize that. They have to know that the moment they see a black person walk into the room, mm -hmm. they have to look and go, what can I learn from this person? Not, oh my God, how did you get in there? Mm -hmm. So I think it starts with a thought. And once that thought has been addressed, again, it's going to be trauma as Peter talks about, but you know what? We're all facing trauma. Every one of us, no matter who you are, there's some trauma somewhere. No one had a rosy childhood. No one had a great marriage. You know, there's something there. So we all have to sit down and address it. Take that moment and face it. And then moving on, be an advocate. Be action-driven advocate. You know when you see something wrong, Silence just condones a behavior. You don't, again, address it, as Peter said, with kindness. And it's, and one thing I want to say, it is not our job to educate you. It is not our job to educate you. Go out, research. There's so many wonderful voices that are speaking now but also go back and don't be afraid to learn the history. So many people now are trying to wipe history out. And I know some schools, they, they think they teach slavery as, oh, this was fun. Black people wanted mm -hmm. this. Go back, look at history, learn and relearn and then ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask because we, we will talk to you if you ask, but you need to do your research first and come to us with, I want to say a more educated question, not one bred from ignorance, because again, we don't, we kind of don't have patience for that anymore. <laughs> we want to move on to the next step. And then Zero. most of all, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> time's up, time's up on that, right? Action sustainable planning. So I am, I'm very excited with this conversation. I'm hoping this grows into more conversations, more doors open, and more ways that we can address this and move it forward where no one feels like it's a handout. This is something that we have earned every piece of, if not more. So that's all I've got to say. Those are my words of <laughs> wisdom and Thank you. <laughs> all, all I'm going to say is thank you. I'm honored to be in your presence. And I'm listening. Here we go. I thought it froze a little bit. I know we're pushing the limits on all that energy we're throwing out there, but I'm listening. And and uh, we will take action, as I mentioned, on behalf of my influence. And I do have a little bit of influence on PMA and Pilates Anytime and others in the community. We will extend that. and We'll work together on bringing that awareness. So thank you all very much. Um, I really appreciate it. My heart is full. I I have a heart full of sorrow for not acting more dominantly as Sanja mentioned, but I want you to know that I'm gonna turn the sorrow, it's already gone into anger. And from anger, I want it to go into healing and action. And so um, we're ready to move forward with that. So we want to be an ally and we know that, that we need to turn some time over and get your voices out there. So, um thank you so much and we'll be in touch we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep things moving god bless thank you thank you